This is Charlie Parsons and welcome back to another episode of the Parsons Podcast. We're here today, Brentwood, Essex at the Matchroom Parsons, HQ. The Parsons Podcast. You know that actually wasn't my idea. Well, I mean, I like, well, firstly, it goes to show how unbelievably arrogant you are. It's we, not my choice of name. He goes out of control. I mean, anyone that has the, a show named after them, mm. that's like me going, welcome to the Eddie Hearn Show. I actually didn't choose the name. Of course you didn't, mate. I didn't. Okay. Genuinely didn't. So you don't like the name? I don't, I don't like the name. I mean, I'm looking at this screen now thinking, what sort of production values is this? Well, because I'm only here on my own, so we're rolling with oh. what we've got, Eddie. Well, you didn't have any staff with you. No. You didn't have any team or any of your assistants. Oh. You made the trip all the way from Sirens yesterday. Did you drive here today? No, I don't drive. Okay. I have, so I was in Essex Tuesday, Wednesday. And then, seeing as you weren't about Tuesday, Wednesday, I stayed in Melbourne, not just for you, just for you, mate. Wow, where'd you stay? Uh, I actually don't know. I ended up like being near Colchester, like wow. an okay. hour away or so. But we're here. Um, Eddie, the point of this, obviously, more steering more away from boxing itself. I know you've gone over your life story, so we'll try and spice it up a little bit. Um, first childhood memory. Oh, yeah. I think... I find it really interesting to talk about when, how old you are before you start actually remembering things. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. So we are now in the Matchroom HQ, which is where I moved to when I was five or six. Prior to that, I don't actually remember anything. I lived in Onga. And I like sometimes I drive past the house and go, but I don't actually remember anything. But you know, you know, like the house... Yeah. Stairs, you remember walking up them stairs, looking out that window. I don't really remember a great deal about that. So probably here, to be honest with you. Like I remember we lived like we lived in a very different house in Ongo compared to this house. And obviously my dad was in the process of making money. So when we came here, it was like, you know, my old man, like, he's from Dagnum, and he was like rocked up here and he's like fucking, we've cracked it, look at this, he was like Del Boy, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and as a kid, we were like, bloody hell, and like going out in the field, this and like, yeah, yeah, because then Brentwood was very different, it was sort of more villagey, like, yeah, and this yeah, was just, yeah. this was in the middle of nowhere, this massive house, with 30 acres, with woods and lakes, and like, we were just running around going, this is mental, and for him, obviously, it was particularly mental, because of where he came from, and you know, this, this, this is why we remain here now, today, um, as our head office because it's a place that we're very passionate about and has been very good to us. On that note, um, I know your father, Barry, someone who's very influential and I know you've spoken before about how much <clears throat> almost your drive for success is based off wanting to do better than he did. Mm. Um, is he the most influential figure in your life still? Do you believe Yeah, that? I mean, look, it's not just about wanting to do better than him. My childhood like everything that I've learned is about competition and that's why I'm so passionate about sport for kids and the younger generation because they live in a world now where they're just being infiltrated with content Mm. and for me the best way that a kid can learn about life and what it takes in life is by a sport right like winning losing Discipline, respect, manners, teamwork, individuality, like, and and all of those things are lacking in in the world today for the the younger generation. So for me, people don't understand this. I was taught that winning is the only thing that ever matters. And so everything's a competition. But we did that through sport. We would play here, we'd play football, we'd play cricket in the garden. It was like life or death. Like my old man was literally diving, tipping fucking free kicks around the corner so I wouldn't score it would never be like I've taken five penalties and missed every one yeah, let this one well, through your legs no let one penalties. through your legs he was never that guy and because also he, he wanted me to understand that you don't get given anything I, listen I had a good, great upbringing I'm a lot luckier than other people but he still wanted me to know yeah. got to work for everything so the competitive nature for me I wanted to be a star right and if I could do it through sport that would have been my dream but I wasn't good enough so I don't want to be Barry Hearn, so I'm proud to be here, but I don't want that to be my greatest 
achievement. You want your own magazine? Yeah, I want to, you know, say, fuck, Eddie, oh, yeah, by the way, well, wasn't his dad a promoter as well? Yeah, whatever. But fuck me, that guy, he changed the sport. And that's, but that's competition. Still, the fundamentals are still from sport. Competition. I want to beat him. I used to want to beat him out there or when we sparred or whatever. Now I want to beat him in he's terms of what he's achieved. Yeah, 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 so. okay. On that note, I was speaking to Jamie last night and I was telling him about sort of that we were doing this. And Jamie and Ward. Oh, right, yeah. And, come on, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> James. Um, and we mentioned the importance of, obviously, how important your father was to you, but you actually don't have a son. Mm-hmm. What is the? I know Frank is the future. <laughs> <of> Frank's <laughs> not your son, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's weird for me. I've got two. What is the future like? I don't know. I think that the way that my mind works is the future. It all ends with me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and I think it doesn't mean that you know the old school mentality in a family business is the son is the one that carries on the legacy and the daughter is the one that you just want to be happy. Yeah, yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? But, so I think that was very much the mindset of, of my dad in that era. Things have changed and women, quite rightly, have the right to do, to follow in anyone's footsteps. I don't, like, I'm very lucky to do what I do but at the same time, I don't necessarily want my daughters to have to have the same pressures that I've had. And that yeah. pressure comes from trying to achieve in your own right and step out of the shadow. So I know that my kids are going to be, and they are at the moment at school, Eddie Hearn's daughters, right? Just like I was Barry Hearn's son. It's just what happens. I want them to achieve in their own name, in mm-hmm. their own right. And I, I, most of all, I want them to be happy. If that's following in my footsteps in the sport business world, no problem. But I would love to see them. So for me, I went out and did my own thing, but my job was always to follow in the footsteps of my dad. Mm. And I don't feel like that pressure should be on them. If they want to do it, happy. But I would much rather them go out and play sport or, you know, be involved in TV or I don't know something rather than like don't feel the need I still feel the pressure today that I need to finish and it's my obligation because of what I've been given in life to carry on what he started but with that being said then do you feel that maybe Matram could end with you. I mean, you've yeah, spoken time yeah, and time yeah, again that, about you. At the moment, do, but there's, ne- there's levels. But, but, to 70, but, right? yeah, but there's levels, yeah. So at the moment, we're a family business that was created in a tiny office underneath a snooker hall in Romford. Yeah. We're now a huge global business with offices around the world, one of the most powerful organisations in sport. And the next move is, you'll see over the next few years, we will move, we will float the business on on the stock market we will continue to go like, and it, it's like where does that go so there may be a point where we look at it and go it's our time you know but I don't want I don't want to be 70 odd and stressing out over it's not for you know and, and whilst I follow in my dad's footsteps he's there he's over there now working grafting grinding every day because that's what he wants to do mm. I'm not I don't have to do the same as him in every, you know, in every step. I might get to 50 or 60 and go, no, I don't want to stop. But for me, I see, I do, I probably do see it ending with, with me and him sort of walking off into the sunset and go, what a great run. But my daughter might finish at university and go, Dad, I want to, I want to carry on the matrim legacy. And I would never stop him from doing that. But I don't, I don't want her to feel the same, you know, obliged. But I just feel that, I'm, I've been incredibly lucky, but at the same time, what I've chose to do or what I feel I've been obligated to do has probably restricted me in other areas of life. Yeah. Because I haven't been able, I'm not, look, I don't have it hard like some people, but at the same time, my life is just work, 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 work mm. to the bone every fucking day. Mm. So, and I've been doing it a long time now. You know, I was thinking the other day, I've been working for 25 years 
25 years I've been working. Yeah. Like, and that actually scares me a little bit. But I've loved it. I love work. I love it. It's a huge challenge. But there's other things to do as well. So we'll see. Back to the boxing point. Mm. The roots, the beginnings for you. Obviously, your father is such a prominent figure in that. But is there a memory that sort of sticks out? And I know you've spoke about the Harrison story and stuff. But maybe before then, where you and and about going into boxing and, and, and picking it up yourself and then what was the sort of turning point? I mean, everybody talks when they talk to me about Audley, the Audley Harrison story and how that got me into boxing. The bug for boxing was built decades before that. Mm. Um, as you know, boxing is an incredibly addictive sport. Yep. It's a, a sport that gets into your veins and you just, you can't get enough of it. When you talk about memories, my memories are different to, you know, a, a normal person who got into the business. My memories are going to my dad's show at Cliff's Pavilion in South End and Mickey Duff coming over to me with a broken leg, telling me, get out of my seat, boy. And me saying, fuck off, it's my dad's show, who do you think you are? And then my dad finding out that I said that and going, oh, Eddie, that's Mickey Duff, don't say that. And, like, you know, another one would be going to um, Loughton, South Woodford with Jim McDonald when he was training for Azuma Nelson and being welcomed into his home as a 10 or 11-year-old with his lovely wife, Kim, making me kiwi fruits that he used to eat all the time. Um, watching the same fighter, you know, that night get beat against Azuma Nelson in an unbelievable fight, but the same guy, Jim McDonnell, who was like a hero to me, get knocked out against Kenny Vice and get stretched back to the changing room, still unconscious, and me standing there watching him, thinking he was going to die in front of me. Like, or being at the Royal Albert Hall and going to the toilet in the 10th round while Michael Watson was fighting Mike McCullum coming back and it's all over he's been yeah. knocked out and like they're so and they're so vivid those memories you know and, and from there I mean I could tell you so many you know being at the, the um, Ulster Hall in Belfast with Paul Silky Jones <laughs> about to go and fight Damien Denny and, and just before the ring walk him just breaking down in tears in the change room and I I'm like 13, but I don't know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my dad going to Germany for Johnny Nelson to fight Marcus Bock for the European title and jumping up and down when Johnny Nelson stopped him in, I think, the 12th round. And there was a riot in there. And I was full to, like, you know, hanging around with Francis Ampofo pretty much my whole life, going over Spurs with him every Saturday, going into the Romford Deep Pan Pizza with him and Herbie Hyde having pizzas every like, I'd, My whole life was built around being at shows, watching fighters, you know, being at the Sheffield City Hall with Naz just running around after him while he was strolling around like causing trouble. Him, yeah. that, that was like bringing belts out. Like that that was that was what built me in boxing. Like the other stuff was just a natural progression from God, from fate, from luck, whatever you want to call it. But those foundations like I think one of the things that makes me laugh sometimes and actually it does annoy me a little bit is that people think that I don't know boxing like and I'm, I'm always conscious to give fighters advice because I feel like they'll look at me and go fuck it like what right do I have to advise to tell a fighter about training around about boxing about technique about all these things when I'm not a fighter yeah. I don't go through that yeah. but the reality is I've been watching boxing since I was eight years old, yeah. like nine, and, and the closest points of the sport. And I've seen the highest, highest levels as a promoter, mm. and I've seen it as a kid, and I've seen it. But I, like, I feel like I, I can give so much to fighters in terms of advice, but I still feel a little bit reluctant to do it because I'm not a trainer, I'm not an expert. But um, yeah, so my route into boxing was built well before Audley Harrison. But little things happen in your life that just change direction. Like I was never, when I was doing golf and I was representing athletes, and I never wanted to be in boxing. I thought, I don't want to be a boxing promoter. But we started doing prize fire, and all of a sudden, then I met Audley. And little turns in your life, that's what happens in life. 
And, you know, I'm not a deeply, deeply religious person. I'm fairly religious, but I really believe in little pieces of fate where God lines a path for you to walk down. It's just whether you walk down it or not. If you don't, it's not the end of the world, but things are given to you to to take you to your calling. or your. And, and this was obviously, with everything I've been through as a kid, that was my moment to follow in that path. And when I did the David Hay, Audley Harrison fire, that was the moment right there where it was either like, walk away, or you have this opportunity here. And, you've got to and I that went there with that opportunity, and that's where it all happened. With that being said then, boxing is something, and I know you've touched on it in previous podcasts or etc., you have your down moments, but you can't really dwell on them because it's a sport that just moves 24-7 at such a quick pace. But do you have a distinct first memory where it was sort of the first moment where you sort of thought, fuck, I'm going to have to overcome this adversity. Uh, obviously something that will be more... Yeah, I mean, the, that, but like, hey, Har- was, hey Harrison was obviously, was that moment where I just, it like, it was... There was a couple. One was McCloskey against Khan, where, again, I was up there at a press conference and it was just, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. Like, really, Matcham had been representing Paul McCloskey. He got the fight. I was kind of thrust in to do that. Then the fight gets stopped from a ridiculous cut, actually. And then, like, there's uproar, everyone's shouting. I'm, I'm falling out of Assi Bally. Like, I'm, I was a kid. Like, I remember pe- people think that right now, I can go into any press conference in the world. The one thing I will you never see me have is notes. Yeah. Right? The one ability that I have is the ability to sell and talk. I'm not a genius. I'm not sm- I'm smart. But like I can sit in front of 15 fighters here now. And this comes back to my love for the sport and my knowledge of the sport. And I can do a press conference off the bat for an hour yeah. without even knowing what's like, Knowing the, the, the geezers at the back of Three, two, yeah. one. Honestly, I have absolutely no idea what, what I'm going to say. Yeah. I go, right, here we go. And I just point there, and I know every fight, I know every record, I know exactly. And really, like, the, those, those moments get built over time. So when you talk about moments that haven't gone your way, yeah, Hay Harrison was like one of those moments. I used to sit at those press conferences with my hands under my ass because they were shaking so much yeah. like this isn't something that you just uh, uh, your first so one you just go yeah. you put yourself in life you put yourself in yeah. difficult situations but you have to continuously and that if you do that you'll get more comfortable in those situations so hey Harrison great example McCloskey Khan even Froch Butte which was like the greatest night of all time when I jumped in the ring early and like you go on social media and say the IBF are talking about yeah. You know, or, or under IBF rules, if a corner man goes in the ring, you can they can get, get disqualified. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. fuck, yeah. like because you're learning, yeah, yeah. you know. And, and again, experience is the only thing that's going to take you to those places. So there's been loads of times the Jarrell Miller drug yeah, test, and then and then and then even with the corner stuff, you know, that's really a moment where you sort of look at things and go, fuck me. And actually, the more you achieve and the more money you make, the less you want to be in those horrible situations because you turn around and you go, fuck it, I don't need it anymore. Yeah. You know, why do I need it? I've completed boxing. I've made a load of money. Why do you want to fucking listen to some geezer on Twitter who, who probably works for another promoter who's all day sending you fucking abuse all day, right? Why? You don't need it, mate. But you do need it because you need to get up every morning and you need to win, right? And... When people start saying, oh, I know they're doing this global thing, but are they losing their foothold in the UK? Ah, oh, you know, that's the worst thing you could say to me. Do you know what I mean? Because when you get complacent, that's when you're really at, you're vulnerable. Mm. But when someone like me has got their back against the wall, I know what I'm doing. But, like, life is about being resilient and just carrying on. And, you know, I think that, um, but you've got to, You've got to have the appetite for it because everything's going to get you down. Mm. Right? Some people have got levels of stress and some people have got levels of stress. I'm lucky that 
my levels are up here. Tolerable. But so is the stress. Like it's yeah, not like yeah, 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 yeah. I've got these stress levels, but actually this is where my stress is at. It's these are what I can take. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. You so, know, and then it goes up and down. You have a bad day, kind of bend, and it goes boom, and it goes past what you can take. Mm. And that's where you've got to be able to control yourself. We talked about earlier about staying fit, staying healthy, staying all these things. Um, and making sure you're resilient. That's a key word. Interesting you speak about the Connor Ben situation. I did the first episode with Callum and he spoke to me. He said, I think it was that Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. He went in and he sat in his house early hours of the morning after having what could only be described as, I imagine, meetings all day. Do you explore foreign boards, mm -hmm. things like that? And he said he just sat there and he, he said he felt like he'd done something wrong despite following everything in the book. He had his missus and his kids upstairs and he just felt so, so empty. What do you, what do you do in those moments? Because I no, suppose I there's always something it, next. But, but, I suppose you had a straight you know, I, if, you, if you imagine how Calla fell, I was 50 times lower. You know what I mean? Because one, it was my fire. And of course, you know, I don't mean it's disrespectfully, Calla's a brilliant promoter, but I'm, my profile is as such that I get the blame for everything anyway. Mm. So, right then, I mean, that was definitely the lowest point of my career, was those moments where you, and like, it's very, like the, the one thing you should never do really is take social media too seriously. Yeah. But it's really difficult when you're passionate about something and you wanna engage with the fans and you wanna read, where you literally have accounts. Their job, whether it's on behalf of someone else or whether they're just so fucked mentally, give you abuse all day. And I have a dozen of those accounts yeah. here. And they, I used to have one, now you've got a dozen there. Yeah. And it's like, you shouldn't let it bother you. And I, I shouldn't even read it. But I, I, I don't mind admitting, I do, because I, I care and I'm passionate. So those moments, but kind of like the dark moments, are the ones that really give you the great moments, you know, the comebacks, the great nights. And I feel like, too much is said nowadays about mental health and depression. It's like, you just have to understand, whatever you do, whatever you're going through, life is hard and difficult, and you will get times that will make you want to break. Yeah. And that was a time that made me want to break. I don't mind saying it, because it's, if it helps other people, like, I was a breaking point. Like, I, was, I wasn't, you know, to a point where I felt like shit. My temper was bad. I had no time with the kids. I was just like, I, w I was low. But there has to be a distinction between having a tough time and going through it and being depressed or like, we we're all gonna feel those moments. It's how you handle them. But that was, you know, like Calla said, I mean, again, it was a tough time for Calla because he got a lot of stick as well. But it was a tough time for everybody in that situation. Eddie, we spoke about your childhood, your upbringing, memories. Um, you spoke about being an 18 year old and sort <laughs> of the golf for you, just going out with the lads and mm. enjoying yourself at the time. You've still gone on, I mean, compared to what you were doing at 18 to what you're doing now, incredible. Is there still certain things that you would go back and tell your 18 year old self? Oh, that's a good question. Cheers, mate. Told you, I'm not bad I think at this. the one thing, the one bit of advice that I could give is, your life takes some unbelievable turns in terms of the person that you become, right? So when I look back at myself at 18 or 19 at your age, I just laugh because I thought I was the absolute nuts, right? And one thing I've always done is I would go out till four or five o'clock in the morning but I would be on the road at 7 a.m. Yeah. I was representing golfers at the time, mainly at 20, 21. I would be up in Manchester, and my mates used to say to me, oh, how do you do that? But that's just, like, I would never, you but I would never, but also it's mindset. I would never miss a day's work. Mm. I would never, but I just laugh at myself now when I look back, and I feel like just, you have to understand that you're gonna change, you're gonna evolve, you're yeah. gonna be a different person than you are now. So don't, don't stress yourself out about it. Like, you're 19. My life advice to you is you're in a great position. I 
feel like you have to make sacrifices from that age. I feel like too many people, I see people who left my school so bright, went to uni, came out, did a year's traveling, went back to do another course, and then they were 24, 25, and actually going into their first job. Yeah. No, but I, I'm a big believer in going into the workplace at 18. Yeah. Because where you are after those three years versus where you'd be after university is a much better position. Yeah. And there's no doubt in that. But the university is also a blessing as well. So I think if I could tell myself anything, it would just be enjoy yourself, but don't stress. Keep working hard, find a passion, make sacrifices. Um, because the foundations that you build during those years will give you early success in life. Like some people start getting serious in their late 20s. I feel like really the time to get serious is when you leave school. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. A bit more personal, this question. Mm. What keeps you awake at night? Mm. Just work, just thinking, just planning, just scheming, just trying to win, really. I guess what keeps me awake at night is competition you know like that is such and, a many hurdles. I know but not, not those individuals <laughs> yeah. but just make sure like I know they can't I know this is pretty arrogant but I know they're not in my league right but I also know that if I get complacent or if I don't keep my workload to where it is, you can be beaten, right? But if you're good and you outwork people, you actually can't be beaten. Mm. It's physical, like you can get a little bit of bad luck and someone can try and fuck you. But over a period of time, you cannot lose. So that's why I'm saying, like even back down to you, you're good at what you do. Therefore, if you work harder than everybody else, you're gonna be a success. That's the reality. And that's just what keeps me up at night. In a sick way, I feel like if I turn my phone off at 10 and I set my alarm for eight, there's three hours there that I really could have fucking got some work done. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's what you're up against. You have to see it like that. Because when people want to go on a beach for two or three weeks, so do I. But when I'm on the beach, I'm doing a Zoom. laptop for Exactly. And I just, it's, and it's a sick, and that's why, you know, but that's a, sacrifice you make to where you want to be. That's why I don't want to do it. Because I do want to have that period in my life where I go... Switch off. Yeah, but, but maybe I won't enjoy that as much. So maybe I'll just do it till I'm 90, like Bob Aaron. Two more from me. Um, when the time comes, and you've spoke about the time, mm. but I suppose even then you've said maybe you do do a Bob Aaron. How do you want to be remembered, Eddie? Is it someone who... Mm. Do you want to be remembered want, in a selfish sense for your own legacy, or do you want to be remembered as to what you've done for the sport, what you've done for certain people? I, I want... It's, it's a couple of folds. Number one is, I want the people that I helped, talking about individuals, mm. to say, fuck, he done a lot for me. Like, and I appreciate what he did. And he was a good man, and he cha he helped change my life. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I know it sounds a bit morbid, but like you know, like at your funeral. Yeah, it it would be nice to have people go to fucking like listen. And I'm not, I'm not sometimes the most social. Maybe I'm not the most um, like heartwarming guy to people because I'm a little bit fucked in the head of just work, 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 win, 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 and that 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 completely sort of. Um, you know, takes over my mind and my thinking. So I just feel that um, that I want the sport to say he was the best to ever do it because I always wanted to be the best to ever do it in sport, but was fucking useless at everything. So the next best thing is for me in a sport or yeah. in business to people say, fuck, he was good, mm. fuck. And the third thing is I want to I want the sport to say, and this is much more about my mindset now, from a grassroots perspective, to say he gave a lot back. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Boxing has given me a great life. It's also caused me a lot of stress, but it's given me great moments and a great life. I want to give something back. 
So I want people to say he did a lot in the community and I don't want that now because there's a lot I do that people don't know. There's a lot I do that people do know because I put it out on social media. But for other reasons rather than just to gloat about what I do in the community. But I want, and my dad used to say this all the time, I never really used to get it. Like he always used to say, number one, you look after yourself. Number two, you look after your family. Number three, you look after your friends. Number four, you look after your business, your, your people. Number six, you look after your area. Then you look after your country. Then you look after your world, depending on how, how big you get. The community is a big thing to me. And the, when I talk about community, I'm not talking about Brentwood and Onga. I'm talking about the boxing community. Yeah. Because that's what I'm passionate about and that's what I care about. Um, so I, in that respect, threefold. People I've worked with saying he was a good man. He, he delivered everything he promised me he'd deliver. And he helped me a lot. Number two is the sport to say, love him or hate him, he was good. And number three, the sport within the community to say, he changed people's lives through giving them opportunities. A bit like you, Parsons. Or changing people's lives. No, no, me changing <laughs> lives. <laughs> so, I mean, I've changed so many lives, yeah. Um, finally, Eddie, mm. away from boxing, mm. I suppose it's two in one, really. Um, your proudest moment in life away from boxing, and I spoke to Joe Cordina about this yesterday, and he sort of said birth of his children, and that's one yeah, that's, that's always going to yeah. come up. And also, what is, and I know you don't have much time to unwind, mm. when you do, I know golf's a hobby of yours. Yeah, I don't really well, do unwind you get up to? Yeah, training for me is the big thing. Like, training's helped me a lot. Like, I'm not fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it's helped me a lot. It relaxes me, it makes me feel good, it de-stresses me. I like to play golf, but probably don't play it enough. Um, I like to watch my children play sport. That makes me really happy. Like, watching my daughter go down to Brembo Boxing Club and just standing there watching her hit the bag, hit pads, that makes me feel unbelievable. Watching my other daughter in the cricket nets playing for, or going on county trials. Because I just, I just love sport, you know, and, and my, I remember the feeling that I would give my dad and my mum through playing sport at a high level and then watching me. Um, yeah, the birth, the birth of your kids is, um, is definitely, you know, that's, that's always the ultimate moment in life. Um, I, I think selfishly, best achievement is probably um, outperforming or competing with my dad in terms of ability, level, legacy, that kind of stuff really, because I could have been, and probably my values for life, business, hard work, you know, like I feel like I could have been a right fucking horrible, like spoil, and I was, pro I think I was going down that way at 14, 15, 16. But understanding the values of hard work, I think that's probably my greatest achievement, considering the upbringing that I had and the background that I've come from. Eddie, thank you very much. I have to say it is a pleasure. I've taken up a lot of your time today. I know you're in a busy moment. This has been another episode of the Parsons Podcast. Of the Parsons Podcast. Available exclusively to Boxing Social and coming soon to Spotify. Eddie, thank you very much. No problem.